just like the song by Mercy Me. I can only imagine. We don't really know what's going to happen when we see the Lord face to face, but I'll guarantee you one thing. If you see him face to face in that day in all of his glory and you're in that glorified state and you're in his presence, there, there's going to be something happening. There, it's not going to be a, a, a silence in there. It's going to be some rejoicing going on. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Good to see you, Jeremy. Jeremy's with us today. Amen. Good to see him. Uh, I hope you've had a good week today. Uh, any day, I've always heard the old saying, any day uh, above the ground is a good day. Amen. And I can't think of that's true. That is right. That, that, that's true. We're above the ground. The God's got a still of a, pain, a plan and a purpose in our lives. Let's reach our hands toward that children's church right now and pray that God will put a message upon them young people today. Sister Charlotte has, has got a message from the Lord. She's been praying about it and she's excited about it. Come on, church. Lean your hands that way. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that the Word of God... The word of God, the seed that will be sown in these young people's lives today. That they'll come out of that room today, Lord, with something embedded deep down in their soul that will grow, that it will prosper, Lord, to be something for the kingdom of God. We believe it, Lord. We know that the word never comes back void. And I'm just praying in the name of Jesus for a special anointing to go upon Sister Charlotte and a special hearing to go up on them girls that are in that room today. How many believe that? Come on, pray for them. Amen, in Jesus' name. I believe it. I believe when you walk out of here, your, your mothers and grandmothers, you're going to hear, hey, guess what happened in there today? Guess what happened? And boy, I tell you what, that's exciting. Amen. Amen. How many's got your Bibles? If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 14. Today I want to talk to you about something that you're going to think, Oh, Lord, I've heard this a hundred times, but I'll tell you one thing about it, folks. When we really dissect what I've got to talk to you about today, I'll tell you what, I had to go back to square one. I had to go back to square one in my relationship because I was thinking, Lord, am I really doing that? Am I really what your word requires me to be? Folks, we can overlook things so much and take things so lightly. And, 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 and this Word of God is not something to play around with. This Word of God is something that will not only direct you and lead you into truth, but it will either give you the victory if you really focus on it, or you're just going to struggle through life and not know which way to go. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I tell you what, this message, if it's nothing for, just for me, it has helped me this week. I want to talk to you about this today, folks. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oh, Pastor, we've heard that a hundred. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Are you a disciple? All right, what is a disciple? What is a disciple, Pastor Steve? The word disciple actually translates to learner. You're a learner. You are a disciple of the Lord. You are a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bible says right here in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me. And then he goes on in Matthew 16, 24 and says, Now come after me. Come unto me and come after me. Meaning there's a following that's going to take place. We've got to to kind of be receptive to his word and say, okay, we come unto the Lord. Now, the Lord don't only want us to come unto him and sit idle. He says, now, come after me. Follow and do what I do. Let me teach you. I'm, you, you are a disciple. You are a learner. Amen. A disciple of Jesus Christ lets Jesus teach them. We should always be learning. We never go through 12 years of school and stop and say, well, I'm glad I'm out of school. I'm stopped learning. Folks, I don't care if you live to be 100 years old. You need to continue to be learning. Always learn something, and especially in the Word of God. You never top out in the Word of God. Amen. A true committed disciple of Jesus Christ learns from his master. Not only does he learn from his master, but he becomes like his master. If I around somebody or if I taught you something week after week, day after day, it, you would almost kind of conform to that type of personality, to that type of teaching, to that type of learning. And this is what Jesus is teaching us today. What it means to be a disciple 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, the way you show this to me, Lord, the way you've just stepped all over my toes, the way you convicted my heart and out of love, Lord, and showed me that I need a tune-up. I don't only need a tune-up, but I need a, almost a rebuilding after hearing of this. Lord, don't ever let us walk our walk with you thinking we've got it all figured out and we know where we're at, we know what we're doing. Lord, this is the, your heart right here. This is your heart, especially the day and hour we live, and we need this learning today. We need to know, without a doubt, when we walk out of here, are we a true disciple or are we just disciple in name only? Lord, help me today to bring it out the way you would want to be brought out. Bring it out in love, Lord, but bring it also out in a challenge for everyone that is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Think about it for a second. A true committed disciple learns from his master. And then he becomes like his master. Would you like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, church? Now that's a question that you're probably thinking, Sure, Pastor Steve, I'd love to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But before you answer it, before you really answer it and put it into motion, I've got a question for you. The answer to that question is not as easy as you think it is. It's not as easy to be a disciple as you might think it is. Amen. You've got to understand something. Salvation is free, but discipleship costs something. Salvation is a free gift from God. But serving God, walking with God, living for God, it costs you something. It's not just a free bed of rose ride here, folks, or a smooth sailing. It costs something. Are you willing today, church, Pastor Steve, are you willing to pay that price? Are you really willing to fall in line with what the Word of God says of what a true disciple is? Amen. That's something I hope we can answer today. The sad thing is, is this. We want air-conditioned, streamlined, all smooth sailing, comfortable faith. Oh, come on, let the air just blow in my hair. Let me feel the breeze. Oh, I just love the, the goosebumps. I love the goosebumps, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you for the goosebumps. I'm a disciple. And the Lord goes, really? Really? Well, <laughs> let's find out about that a little bit today. Many don't want to be really fully committed disciples of Jesus because after you hear this message today, you're going to have to really probably do like me and back up and say, Woo, Lord, I don't just need my oil changed. I need a complete rebuild here. Amen. Luke chapter 14. Jesus talking here. Jesus talking here in Luke 14, starting at verse 25. He says, And there went a great multitudes with him, talking about Jesus, and he turned and said to them, now look, you got to understand something. Jesus has been performing miracles, signs, wonders, and everything. He was getting a pretty good following. And then all of a sudden, during this next journey he's going to, he's walking, and he says, oh, the multitudes are following. Then he stops, and he turns to him, and he says, I'm going to be a little stern here, Jesus says. I've got something I need to address here. And look what he says here. If any man comes to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brethren, his sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now I imagine that, boy, that put him in the, put him in stop right there. What? Hate my mother, hate my father, hate my children, hate, hate myself? What? You mean I can't be a disciple? What is going on here, Lord? Think about it for a minute. He had these great crowds following him, multitudes following him. They were amazed at his miracles. They were amazed at what he was doing. The blind eyes were opening. The, the leprosy was falling off of people's body. He was, he was raising people from the dead. He was doing all these things, and his popularity got good. Everybody thought, man, let's just hang around and see what he's going to do next. Let's go to the next town with him and see what kind of ministry he's going to perform there. And what does Jesus do when he sees these people and knows their real hearts? He stops and he turns around to them and he thins out the crowd. He separates something here. He said, whoa, whoa, you're following me for the wrong reason here. 
He said, if any man, let's read it again. If any man come unto me, and he hates not his father, and he hates not his mother, and his wife, and his children, and his brethren, and his sisters, yea, and it's even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. See, he doesn't perform more miracles to get a bigger crowd. He doesn't perform more healings to get a bigger crowd. He doesn't water down the gospel to get a bigger following. He doesn't do them things. What does he do? He turns to the crowd and in a stern but positive and loving way, but yet a focused way, he talks to them about something that shocks them, shocks them in their place. They don't know what to think about what Jesus is saying. What do you mean, hate? I thought you was a God of love. What do you mean by hate? What do you mean, Jesus? Now, one thing we've got to, to say about Jesus here, he was a man. He didn't hold back, folks. There was no, no hook and switch on him or something. I mean, this Jesus was a loving God walking in flesh, but yet he was firm and he was stern about what he wanted to talk about. And we got to see that he was not one of these that's just out looking for easy followers. Oh, yeah. There's people today, churches today, they don't want to be stern. They don't want to be focused on the real truth of the word. They want the easy followers. Don't make no waves here. Let's, let's go in the no wait zone. Don't, don't make no waves. Let's go in the no wait zone. That way everybody's comfortable. Amen. Jesus, he don't pull no punches. The problem we have today in many churches is the gospel is getting watered down in order to keep the followers. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on your toes. I, I won't preach against sin no more. Come follow me, come on. And that's what we do sometimes. And Jesus knew that these people following him was only for what they could either get or the good feelings or, wow, that's amazing what you did to that guy. Or, whoa, wow, did you raise that woman up like that? Oh, wow, let's just follow him to see what else is going on. And Jesus had to stop it somewhere and say, you followed me too long like this. Now I'm going to separate some folks. I'm going to see who the true disciples are. I'm going to see who the true people that really want me and not the giftings. Amen. We can, you know you can live for God for just the giftings. And God is saying, no, oh, oh, wait a minute. That ain't what I want you living for. I want you to live for me because you love me. Because you love me with all your heart. Like you love me more than you do your life. More you do your family. More than you do your jobs. More you do your houses and your stuff. I need followers like that. That's a true disciple. They are learners. Amen. They want to learn from me. They want to be like me. They want to represent me. You see... These churches sometimes are watered down to get followers, and Jesus never did that. And folks, I'm not going to do it either. I'm not going to do it either. Amen. You see, when we follow Jesus, he's saying, I invite you not to share in my popularity, but Jesus is saying, I invite you to share in my unpopularity. Because you're not going to be a very popular person when you stand for the truth. When you stand for the Word of God, and sin is wrong, righteousness is right, living for God is right, living for the world is wrong. When you stand and you separate yourself that much in this world, you're not going to be very popular out there. I know, I know some people that say, hey, you know, uh, and, I, and I'm not talking negative in a sense, I'm just saying we cannot let down on the, the holiness of God. Can I hear an amen? You know God is holy. And what does he say? Be ye holy for I am holy. And what has happened to the holiness in the church is we've let down because we think, well, we're in a different generation and maybe it, we won't get them in the church unless we kind of let down on the standards and, 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 and the things of serving God. Now, I'm not talking about being so strict on some things that is just way out there and man-made stuff. I'm talking about holiness in God. I'm talking about when we come into this sanctuary, this is a holy place that God comes and meets you in. This is not a playground. This is not something you go to the theater and throw popcorn everywhere. This is not that place. This is a place that God chooses to meet you in every Sunday. And He is a holy God. And I remember even the scripture of where Moses come. He didn't say, yeah, Moses, bring them dirty sandals up here and just kind of walk on up here with all that old stuff from the road on them and everything. Let me talk to you. He said, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Take them sandals off. Meaning, look, I want you to come as clean as you can before me because I've got something to say. 
And we have lost that, I think, in the, in the modern-day church here today. Amen. But I want you to know, are you willing to be unpopular for Jesus? Unpop- not popular to Him, but unpopular to the world out there. Because my Bible tells me that any man who loves the world is an enemy against God. But I love the world, and I love the things of the world. And Jesus is saying, can't be my disciple then. Because my disciple is in the world, but they're not of the world. So we need to focus that. I want to talk to you about four things right here that a true committed disciple of Jesus Christ is. And I hope that we all are willing to pay that price. Let me say it again one more time. Are you willing to be a disciple for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to go according to what this Word of God is going to say today and fall in line with it and and say, yes, I can do that. I will do that by the Lord's help. Or are you just like, oh, it's too much for me. We'll see. Okay? We're going to see. There's an old saying out there, you pay for what you get. You ever heard that? You pay for what you get. How many like a good deal in a store? You go into a store, oh, man, that's on sale. That's a good deal. And you go in there and you buy it and the price is down on it and all that and you feel good about it. But sometimes, just because something's cheaper, don't mean it's better. Sometimes you pay for what you get. I've bought things before that I walk in and think, man, do I want to buy that Craftsman tool set or do I want to buy that China tool set? That old China false metal type stuff. I thought, man, I can get the same amount of tools for about half the price. And in the past, I've actually done that. And the first time you use a wrench or something, it breaks in your hand or the screwdriver strips or something like that. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, man, I should have paid the extra price for the better quality. And you know what happens when you do that? When you pay that price for the, the, the better quality, sure, it might have hurt that wallet a little bit, but in the long run, you're happy because it's a quality that will last forever. And then the price goes away. You don't think about the price after a year or two because it's been so dependable for you and the quality has been so good that the price just goes out of your head now. You don't think about what you paid because it was worth it, see? It was worth it. And that is true, amen, in the Lord too because when you pay the higher price for the better quality, you, 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 you soon forget that about the price and say it was well worth it. I'm glad I did that. You got to understand something. There's no cheap discipleship. It costs to serve the Lord. I can just tell you folks, it costs you something. Amen. And but but let me say this, it's worth it. It's really worth it. It's going to be worth it. Now I know there's some that's not willing to pay the price because it's it's too much. It's it's an everyday thing. It's an every every step thing. It's a it's an every thought thing. It's it's just everything. It's got to be engrafted the word of God in our heart. And some are not willing to pay that. But let me start right here with the number one thing here of what it takes to be a true committed disciple of Jesus Christ. A true true committed dedicated disciple of Jesus Christ will worship at all costs. That's number one. They will worship at all costs. Look at verse 26 again. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters and yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross, bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What's it saying, Pastor Steve? What does this mean? It means Jesus needs to be before all your personal relationships. When you pick up the cross, amen, that means you got off of it. He's on it. You got off of it, and now you're carrying it for him. You're carrying the cross of Jesus Christ in your walk. That means he has become personal to you in everything you think, everything you say. Amen. It means this. He's not talking about hating your family like in a negative way because he taught us to love one another, didn't he? What he's saying is this. To be a true, committed disciple of mine, you've got to put me before everything and everyone. That's what he means by hate. Not hate your parents, not hate your children. means I've got to be number one. Now, I love my wife. We've been married 38 and a half, almost 39 years. But my wife knows that Jesus is number one in my life. She's number two. She's number two. And you may be saying, how can you do that? Because the Lord tells me that I have got to love him 
more than anything in my life because I look at it like this. He gave me her. He is the one that's in control of everything. It doesn't mean I neglect her. It means I, everything that I focus my life on in my relationship with her is represented by him. Everything is about him. And if you'll put Jesus number one in your life, I'll guarantee you, folks, your marriage is going to be good. If you put Jesus number one in your life over everything, your children's going to be blessed. Your grandchildren's going to be blessed. All these things are going to be blessed because he says that love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, not most of it, all of your heart, all of your soul, all your strength, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. He even wants you to love him more than you love yourself. There's too many people that love theirself. And it really, it's all about self. Self, self. Oh, I love myself. And it's okay to have respect. Hey, it's okay to have respect for yourself. It is. You need that self-esteem. You need that. But don't love yourself more than you do Jesus. Amen. Think about it for a second here. Listen, he's teaching us that we've got to put the Lord before everything. Everything in our life. And some of you are in here saying, oh, oh man, this is going to be, you're already stepping on my toes, Pastor Steve, because you know I love my kids. You know I love my grandchildren. You know I love, I know you do. And I'm not saying don't love them. But I'm saying, is Jesus over them or are they over Jesus? Woo, boy, we can, that's what I'm saying. To be my disciple, did I just read it? Did I read it? That if you don't hate, meaning don't put, don't, they can't be number one. If you don't hate your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yea, in your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Boy, that kind of narrows it down, don't it? It really does. But we look at it from the physical side and say, oh, Lord, does the Lord really mean that? Yes, the Lord means that. He wants you to love your children. He wants you to love your grandchildren. He wants you to love your, your parents and your, your husband and your wife and all that. But he has got to be number one. To be his disciples. He said, you got, you got to put me here. Your children here. Not that you don't love them any less, but I've got to have all, I've got to be loved by you. I want every bit of you not holding back. All, all, not some of your life, but all of your life. Amen. Matthew 6, 24. Look what he says right here. Jesus kind of narrows it down again. 6, 24 of Matthew, he says this. No man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon, meaning there cannot be anything on the same scale as Jesus. Oh, I love everything, but I love the Lord right here equal with it. And Jesus said, no, can't do that. Uh -uh. You're either going to love the one, despise the other, spend more time with one than the other. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon, meaning it's okay to have those things, it's okay to bless those things. It's okay to respect those things. But I've still got to be put on the throne, he's saying. You can't have anything else on the throne but me, the Lord says. Amen. He's saying, I've got to be number one in your life. Is he? Is he? Is he really number one in your life? Oh, yes, he is. Okay, really? Now, when I said that about children, grandchildren, all that, did you kind of have a question mark pop up? Oh, who, who's Pastor Steve talking about here? If you did, then, hey. God's starting to do a little tuning right now. I mean, really, I'll tell you what, folks, this ain't just for you. This right here beat me up this week. It tore my butt up this week because I'm thinking, yeah, I serve the Lord. I serve, yeah, yeah, I love the Lord. Yeah, I love the Lord. But then when I started really thinking what God really wants us to be and do, I'm thinking, am I really at that level? I want to be at that level, but am I really, according to the Word of God, at that level? Do I, do I, Love him more than anything. And it really had to really put an put a, a inventory on my own life. I'm just being honest with you here, folks. Amen. If we're all truthful, I think we all can do that. We must, he must become bef uh, before our personal relationship. He's got to be number one in our life, even before our reputation. Oh, Lord. Woo. Uh, wait a minute. Let me move. I think somebody's stepping on my toes there. Reputation. You are to love God even more than yourself, the Scripture says. To be a disciple, you have to take yourself off the throne and say, Lord, that's your place. That's your place. And put him back on the throne. 
because there's too many folks. And folks, you've met them. You've met them at your workplace. You've met them in church. You've met them at the malls. You've met them everywhere. There's too many folks out there that's all about them. Me, me, me. I'm on the throne. Yeah, I love the Lord, but don't don't dethrone me. Don't dethrone me. Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. There's only one on the throne. There's only one on the throne. It's either going to be you or me. Which one is it? And when we say us, Jesus says, you can't be not my disciple. You're in love with yourself too much. When you step off and let me be on the throne, now you qualify to be my disciple, he's saying. And that's what we need to really see here today. The sad now thing nowadays is there's so many churches out there that have a theme that says self-fulfillment. Come to our church to get self-fulfilled. Come to our church. If you'll just get here today, you'll have self-realization. Just come in here. What do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to say? And everything. Self-image. Let's have that self-image. It's almost church has almost become almost like Burger King. Have it your own way. Seriously. I mean, I'm telling the truth. If you want a hamburger with certain things on it and certain things left off, go to Burger King. Don't do the gospel like that. Well, I'll come to that church, but hey, if you step on my toes and you preach against something that I don't agree with, even though it's in the Word of God, then I'll go to another place. And they're full out there. They're called user-friendly churches. Or, 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 I mean, they are. And I'm not cutting down the fact. I'm just saying this, folks. If you want a place like that, you can go to a place like that, and you can have a smile on your face. But are you really a true disciple? Because Christ is saying to be a true disciple, you've got to live the Word, walk the Word, talk the Word, think the Word, dream the Word. Everything's got to be about the Word of God in your life because that is what sets you free. That's what sets you free. Amen. We, the, we, we You know... It's good to have that positive, healthy self-image. You need that. Amen. But if it comes between you and Jesus, and, and, and you're going to have to say no to it and yes to Him. No flesh. No flesh. No, it's not right. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Do what you have to do. Conform me. Transform me. Move me. Change me. Do whatever you have to do. If we can come in there with that kind of humility, then God says, now that's somebody I can work on. But if we say, no, I've got it all figured out, Lord, I don't need you. If I need you, I'll call you up one day. Just have your line ready. I'll call you if I need you. Let me put you over here on the shelf, Lord, until I need you again. The Lord says, you can't be my disciple. Well, why, Lord? I'm trying to serve you. No, no, no. To be my disciple, I've got, I've got you on speed dial, ready to go at all times. You are watching me at all times. Amen, amen. Think about this. When we talk about... Can we, let me ask you this question. I know it's a lot of questions, but, you know, let me ask you an honest... Can you honestly say today, Lord Jesus, I know you're number one in my life. Can we honestly say that? Is there anybody... You ain't got to raise your hand, but is there anybody in this room that can say, honestly, he is the Lord of my life. He's number one over children. He's number one... Over, is there anyone in this room that can say he is number one in their life? What he's talking about is... Taking up and bearing your cross in verse 27. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying when you pick up the cross and you're bearing it with Christ, then you are representing him, you are talking like him, you are acting like him, you are living like him, you are picking up your cross. And he says if you don't do that, don't pick up your cross and don't bear his cross and don't come after him, you cannot be my disciple, he says. I mean, it just boils right down to that picture right there. What does that mean? It means we are crucified with Christ. Amen. Look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what Paul's saying here? He's saying, when I gave my life to the Lord on the road to Damascus, it was no more my life, it was His. We are bought by a price. You know you're not your own if you're a, if you're a believer. 
If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not even your own. You've been purchased. Jesus owns you. He owns you. Sure, He lets you walk. He lets you talk. He lets you do this and that and the other. But we've got to come to the realization that the, the, the simplest thing that we could do in our life that Jesus didn't get involved in as far as making us is we had to come and say, Lord, I need you as a Savior. I'm a sinner. I need you as a Savior. I need salvation. That's something He couldn't do for us. He provided a way, but we have to come to Him and say, I need you, Lord. Now, once we say that and do that, and He accepts us into the plan of salvation, that's free. Now, we've been purchased by Him, and we're His now. We're not our own. That means everywhere we go, what we say, the way we walk, the way we, we, we talk, everything should represent Him because he, it, He's now in us. It's not us in control. How many know a oh, uh, uh, pastor back years ago named Tozer? Remember him, Dr. Tozer? Amen. Great man of God. You know what he said, taking up the cross means? A man who is crucified, he said, is facing only one way. A man who is crucified, he said, is not going back or not looking back. And that's another thing he said. A man who is crucified has no further plans for his own life. Now that's powerful. That means this. When you are in Christ and Christ is in you and you've been purchased by him, amen, you are not your own no more. You are his, his possession that everything in the future now is not your plan. It's his plan for your life. Now, some of us don't like that, but I'm telling you, that is really the truth. Now, can you say, yes, Lord, I'm crucified with you. Is every being, every part of your being dedicated to him? Are you looking back? Are you looking at your plans ahead for your own life? Or are you letting Jesus plan your life? Think about it. Are you facing only one way with him? Or are you about like this? A well, little world's out there a little attracted too. I'm telling you, when you're crucified with Christ, you pick up your cross and you follow him. That means you deny self. He's back on the throne and you became become a worshiper at all costs. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love that because it this is what it means to be a disciple. Now, let me <laughs> I've kind of rambled a little, but let me ask you that same question I started with. Now, do you still want to be a disciple? Do you still want to be a disciple for Christ? If you do, let's go to another part then. Amen. When you accept Jesus, you surrender your life to him. Amen. The Bible says we are bought by with a price. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. I love this because it's so true. 619 of 1 Corinthians. What? Paul talking. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? Oh, man. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are mine. No, wait, well, that don't say that. Which are God's. In the Old Testament, God met his people, visited his people through the high priest beyond the veil in, 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 in a temple, beyond the veil. That high priest would go in behind that veil and he would meet with God once a year. And he would sprinkle the blood of the bulls and the goats and all the mercy seat. And God would come down and he would meet with that high priest. And that high priest would be kind of like an intercessor for the people out there that had sinned. And when God accepted that each year, and when he accepted that sacrifice, that meant those people's sin out there was covered for another year. Not taken away, but just covered for another year. But when Jesus went to the cross... And he died on Calvary. The Bible says the veil was torn from top to bottom. Opened up for whosoever will now to come in. Into the presence of God. And when we come in, we now, when we accept him and the blood covers us. And our sins are forever forgiven. The Bible says, we just read it, that now you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Not the building, but God lives in you now. That's where that word temple is translated to veos, which means holy of holies. Look it up. Do you not know now that you are the holy of holies of God? That he meets inside of you through the Holy Ghost and walks in you now? 
and that temple needs to be pure and that temple needs to be clean and that temple needs to be in place and that temple needs to be edifying God at the highest. You are now not your own. You are now the temple of God that He lives in. Now, how many know God ain't going to stay in a dirty house? He's not. You might go over to somebody's house and it'd be dirty. That's one thing. You can kind of step over it. Man, can I sit down right here? Man, look at that. You might try that at a physical house. But God says, when you accept me as your Lord and Savior, and I come and live inside of you, and I fill you with my holy presence, I want a clean house. I don't want to come in and see the dust on the walls and all that. I want all the sin out. I want all the attitudes out. I want all the grudge holdings out. I want all these things out because I'm a pure God. And when I stand in your presence, you now represent me. You are now the holy of holies that I meet you in. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your spirit, it, it, my spirit is in you, and it's mine, and it's you, and we're going to work together in this. Amen. That's what it means, folks. So first, true discipleship, being committed to Jesus Christ, we'll worship at all costs. That means we're going to bear a cross. We're going to pick it up and follow Jesus. And we're going to do it, Lord. We're going to do it. It's all about you. Personal relationships are out. Reputation, come on, Lord, it's you. Number one. Number two is this. A true committed disciple of Jesus Christ will work at all costs. We will work at all costs. Look at Luke 14 again, verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and count the cost? Here we go with that cost again. But I want to serve you, Lord. Have you counted the cost? That's what Jesus is saying. Count the cost whether he hath sufficient to finish it. Verse 29, lest happily he had laid the foundation and not able to finish it, and all that behold it to mock him. <laughs> you, can, you, you started off on fire of our Lord, Lord, didn't you? You started off ready to serve God, but you didn't count the cost of what it's going to cost to serve God. You didn't, you didn't know that you're going to be ridiculed and unpopular to a lot of people. And, and, and the foundation is laid, but man, you walked away from the building. <laughs> That's what it said, they mock him. And then what does he say in verse 30? Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus is telling us this for a reason. Because he's saying, when you accept me and you worship me bearing your cross, then the building, you've got to build, you've got to work too. You've got to work on that building. And when you work, and if you're not prepared to work and finish what you've started, then you're going to be mocked and laughed at. He's wanting us to know there's a cost in serving him. There's a cost in being a disciple. See, back in these days, I looked this up. Back in these days, they had vineyards. And in the middle of those vineyards was a tower built to watch over the vineyard. They watched over that. It was a sacred place. The vineyards were popular. And the tower was built in the middle of it. And it says it was there to protect the yard. God says this, our lives is to be like a tower. We are to protect our lives. God's plan for our lives is to build. Build that tower. Build it strong. Watch out. Watch out for what's around you. Build that relationship up with Him. Amen. And if we're not willing to do that, we'll be mocked. We'll be laughed at. We're not able to finish the work that we started. Jesus has a plan for your life and for my life. Amen. Our lives are to be constructed by His plan. A lot of us want to build our own houses. Remember the guy in the Bible that built the barns? He built this nice barn. He got all this stuff. And he says, man, that's a nice barn I got. I got so much stuff, I can't put all my stuff in the barn. I know what I'll do. I'll build the bigger barn so where I can bestow all my goods. And what does Jesus say? Thou fool you. Thou fool you. Basically, whose is that going to be when you're gone? Build things for Christ that last forever because things on this earth are going to be burned up, rust away, and the decay. They're never going to last. As much as you like your stuff, and I like my things, don't get me wrong, I like it, but I know that it's not going to last forever. The only thing that's going to last forever is what I build in Christ spiritually. That's going to last forever. And Jesus is saying that. Let me construct your plan 
let this tower that I want to build in you, Pastor Steve, Church Christ Worship Center, let this be a spiritually conceived from God. That he conceived this. That he is building this tower in your life. And it's also got to be this, a sacrificial constructive. You got to sacrifice. You got to count the cost. If we want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have got to count the, cr the cost or we'll never be able to complete the tower. I know, and you know the truth is this. There's a lot of people, Revelation says it, he that endureth to the end, he that endureth to the end shall inherit, shall gain, shall grow. There's a, there's a, it's, a, it's not a quick race, folks. It's a marathon. That means your building that God is building in you spiritually is to be constructed by him, led by him. He is the engineer of it. He's the contractor of it. He's everything. And you're allowing him to do that. And while you're growing and growing, he's building a stronger, a stronger tower to stand. Remember the scripture says, uh, the Lord is, a, they, they that, what does it say? The Lord is a high tower. That they that run into it are safe. The Lord is a tower. You know, he is that tower that we run to when, we're, when we need comfort. And he wants us to be a tower built by him. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, amen, you've got to let Jesus do the building in your life, but you've got to be willing to work. Now, here's something right here. That, uh, uh, get ready. Hold your feet up. Go ahead and hold them up because you're going to get stepped on right here. The problem we have in church nowadays is there's too many half-built towers that are under construction and it's come to stop. That were under construction, they've come to stop. Too hard. I'm not going to do it. No. Nope. <laughs> you said that about me. I quit. I'm out of here. How many has ever worked on a construction site? Sometimes it gets a little rough out there, don't it? You hear a lot of language, you hear a lot of things. You hear people trying to tell you how to build your own stuff or how to put that in place and all you're doing that wrong and all that. But I'm telling you what, folks, even in the church, when Christ is building your tower and when you're setting the foundation in him, you're going to have other workers around telling you you ain't doing it right. You're not building that part right. Instead of worried about their own tower, they're worried about your tower. Told you. I massage my feet before I come here. I knew I was going to get it. Amen. Christians start off a task, but for whatever reason, they stop building. What did Jesus say about quitting and stopping construction? Luke 9. Luke 9. What did Jesus say about starting something and quitting? Verse 62. Jesus said to them, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Meaning when I've saved you, the Lord's saying, and I've got you in, in this walk, it's going to be some tough days ahead. It's going to cost you something. It's going to be a little tough at times. But if you ever look back, man, maybe I should have, maybe I should have not have done this. He says, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. You're not fit. Amen. What disciple? A disciple is a worshiper that will worship at any cost. A disciple, a true disciple, committed disciple is a worker that will work and build at any cost. Number three, what is a disciple that is committed? One that will war at any cost. Now it's time to fight, folks. You know there's a fight that you've got to put, put up with when you serve God? Look at chapter 14 again, verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another sitteth not down first? And consulteth whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while, he, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. What is this trying to tell us, folks? You see, when we follow Jesus, we come to him in war. There's a battle. We're outnumbered by the world, if you didn't know. We are really outnumbered. And you're either on the Lord's side or the enemy's side. And he's looking for warriors, not cowards. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is, really, this is a scripture that really can hit home with us. A true disciple of Christ, when the battle is roaring and it's getting hot under your feet and the enemy's coming against us with 20,000 and we've only got 10,000, we're outnumbered. 
He doesn't retreat and go hide. And another thing a true disciple don't do, this is for us right here, folks. He never makes a peace treaty with the enemy. Don't do that to me. Don't hurt me. Don't tear me down. Don't talk about me. Let's work this out. Look, folks, when you try to negotiate with the devil, you're in trouble, man. You've got to go head on into him. That's why it says it costs to be a disciple. You go into war. There's a cost. He said, what man, what king goes into a war and don't sit down first and, and go over what it's going to cost to go into this battle? He don't go and send some kind of ambassador out there and say, go out there and see if you can talk them down. We really don't want to make war with these folks. Let me tell you something. You might get peace today with the enemy by doing that, but next week he's going to be on your doorstep again. You can't trust him. That's what, what did we do? What did we do as a country? I'm not a politics here, but what did we do as a country? We go over to a country and we pull people out of a country and leave the enemy in charge of the country. I'm just telling the truth. And we think, oh, they said they won't do nothing. They're peaceful now. They're not going to do nothing. They're going to be okay. They said they were going to be okay. That's what happens to us when we negotiate with the devil. He's going to say, oh, it's going to be okay. I'm not going to bother you. Go on. Just have your own way. And then around the corner, the next thing you know, you look back a year later from that incident over in Afghanistan, and they've done built their army back up, and they've done taken over again. I'm telling you, when you go into war with Christ, you're, 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 when you go into a war with Christ, you go war at any cost because a true disciple is going to have resistance coming against him, but he is a warrior, not a coward. He's a committed, and he fights the battle to the end. He doesn't give up. He doesn't run and hide. He doesn't hide under a hill. He doesn't go into a cave and hide out. He doesn't ret retreat because I know, and you know, the Bible says if God is for us, who can be against us? That means the general's walking before you. And we don't ever trust that. We think God's nowhere around. Lord, don't you know what I'm going through? The Lord says, that's right. Just come on. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Don't give up. Do what's right. A true disciple does not negotiate. Uh -uh. He wears the whole armor of God always, not just when he gets ready to go. He's wearing it all the time. You put on that armor of God every day. Like you put your clothes on this morning to come to church. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That means we're wearing that armor of God. We have that helmet of salvation, that shield of faith, that sword, which is the word of God. We have all these things, that breastplate of righteousness. We're, we're, we're fully armored because, folks, I tell you what, we're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We know that. We fight against powers of darkness, principalities of the air, in wicked places and all. So you've got to be prepared at all times. And I know there's some military people in here, and you don't go into the war and wait for the first shot to come to put on your armor. You don't go and say, well, it's been peaceful around here. I ain't heard no bombs blowing up, no missiles flying around their thing. Come on, let's just go hang out. Oh, they're firing them. Let's go back to the barracks and get our, get our armor and get our weapons together. No, folks, we're in a spiritual battle. You better have them. You better have them to walk out of here and walk in Walmart. You better have those on at all times because the enemy is, is like a roaring lion, the Bible says, seeking who he may devour. Oh, there's a child of God that ain't got his armor on. Get him. Get him. And they go and attack. But if they're walking around and they see that armor, sure, he'll come at you. But he's thinking, oh, man, boy, he's covered all the way around from head to toe. As long as he don't turn his back on me. If he ever turns his back on me, I'll shoot him in the back. See, that's, what he does. that's why that uh, Dr. Tozer said, a true disciple of God, don't look back. He don't turn his back to the enemy. He goes forward toward the enemy. You can always fight an enemy better when he's in front of you than behind you. Because an enemy will sucker punch you, folks. He'll sucker punch you when you're not looking. That's just the way the devil works. Amen. Look at uh, verse 33. Uh, 14 of, of uh, Luke. So likewise, whosoever of you 
that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. What he's saying is this. I want you to go to war. I want you to be ready for war. I want you to evaluate the war. I want you to build your tower. I want you to stay focused in worship and bear that cross. And he's saying, now, whosoever be you that forsaketh not all that he hath, meaning putting everything in the direction of the Lord, he can't be my disciple. Amen. True worshipers, it costs to serve. It costs to serve Jesus every day, not just on Sunday and Wednesday night, folks. You're going to need Jesus when you get up in the morning. You're going to need Jesus when you leave this place. You're going to need Jesus when you go to your workplace tomorrow. You're going to need Jesus when you go to the gas station. You're going to need Jesus when you go to Kroger. You're going to need Jesus everywhere you go, folks. It's just the way it is. There has to be worshipers that are worship at any cost. That means take up your cross. There's got to be workers of the Lord Jesus that will work at all costs. Bring your tools with you. There's got to be warriors that war at any cost. Bring your sword with you. Folks, I'm not talking about just always toting your Bible. Have this right here in here. I, I mean, a lot of people don't walk around. Some do, but not everybody walks around with a Bible in their hand. But he says, put this word in your heart. That way, the day that you need it, what is in, comes out. You know what the Bible says? For the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If all you're around is cussing and negative and jokes and all that, it's all that's going to come out. But if you put this in your heart and you love the Lord with all your heart, then that day when you need it the most, you ain't even got to study on it, folks. I've done it. I mean, the Lord has done it. You ain't even got to, oh, okay, well, where was that scripture at? I'm telling you, folks, it'll come out. It'll come out, and it'll astonish you how it comes out because it's been bedded down in there, and it's ready for the day of war. Finally, this right here, folks. Listen, to be a true, committed disciple of Christ, you've got to worship at all costs. You've got to work at all costs. You've got to war at all costs. And the final thing, you've got to witness at all costs. This is how you're going to be a true disciple right here. Look at verse 34 of chapter 14. Salt is good. Now, Jesus goes from bearing the cross to laying a foundation to working to going against war. Now he's saying salt. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its Savior, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for a dung hill. That's another term for something nasty. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. See, the Lord knows that there's going to be people that don't want to hear the gospel. He knows that. He knew that. There's going to be even some in this congregation, probably, that would rather me be up here preaching a good, feel-good message, one that just kind of makes you feel real, real good, instead of one that challenges you. But what the Lord is saying here today is this. We are like salt. We are the salt of the earth. Now, what does salt do? Have you ever thought about that? Salt means you're a witness. Salt preserves. Back in these days when Jesus called those disciples, those fishermen, to follow him, they were fishermen. They didn't have refrigerators and freezers like we got. How did they keep that from rotting? How did they keep that staying good until they needed to eat it? They soaked it and covered it in salt because it preserved it. It kept it from rotting. It kept it still good to when they, the day they did want to eat it. How many in here like country ham? I love country ham. Same thing with country ham. They salt it down. They put it in a burlap bag. They hang it up. It don't go bad. It don't go bad as hanging out there in that barn and everything. It's preserved. Salt preserves. Amen. It preserves. Jesus called them, and he said he knew that they were fishermen, but yet this salt, this physical salt, preserved their fish. America's problems today is this, folks. It's not the drugs. It's not the pornography. It's not the critical race theory and racism and all that. America's problem, there's a lot of saltless Christians. A lot of saltless Christians. I mean, that's the problem. Well, I wish this country would change around, man. It's going crazy over here. Look at all the crime and the murders on TV. Where's the salt, folks? Where's the salt from the Christian folks? We are the salt of the earth. But I'll tell you what, folks, this country is in a moral meltdown. 
Sin has open range out there to come and go as it pleases. And America's like a broken sewer pipe that's just running, contaminating the land. And the only thing that will decontaminate de de this, this sewer that's running through our land is salt. Salt from the people of God. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Salt preserves. You know what else salt does? It flavors. You ever notice that? How many like a baked potato without salt on it? <laughs> oh, Lord. I've got to have it. I'm like, man, it tastes bland. And that's what's wrong with us, folks. There's too many bland Christians that ain't got no salt. And their flavor's not good to, around others. I'm just being truthful with you, folks. I'm just being truthful. What about your life? Is it flavorable? Or is, it, is it bland? Don't take long to look at that. Colossians, I'm almost through, really and truly, I, I promise. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech, oh, here it goes, look at Paul. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Oh, there's a seat. Salt ain't just a coincidence in the Bible. Jesus says it's there for a reason here. Is your life bland? Does your life bring flavor to others around you? Salt seasons. What it does, it brings hope to the brokenhearted. Salt heals. Salt brings salvation to the lost. Here we go. This is a good one. Salt also burns in an open wound. Whoa. If you had a cut on your finger and somebody put salt on it, what would happen? Oh, whoo, man. It burns, don't it? You know why? Because listen to me, folks. You as a child of God, when you're salt, you're going to irritate some people. Whoa, you hurt me. But you do it in love. And see that open wound, that sin they're living in, when you're salt of the earth and you're around them, it irritates them a little bit because it's in that open wound. And they think, whoa, 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 that salt's getting in here. That salt's getting in here. It's burning. But the reason we are to do that and witness and to be the salt of the earth is because we care for their souls and we're trying to lead them to Jesus to deliver them of that so they can become salt. Can I tell you something? Not everybody's going to love you. I might have shocked you. But the truth is not everybody's going to love you. Not everybody loves me. I want everybody to love me. You want everybody to love you. But it's the truth because Jesus said that. He said the world does not love him. It's not going to love you, he says. But be a good cheer. He said, I've overcome the world. I know everybody's not going to love me, Jesus says. But I'm going to love everybody. Amen. So think about it. Why? Because you're salty, too much salty. And when you're salting somebody, it, 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 it tastes bad to them when there's too much salt on them. You ever had too much salt on something? Can't eat it. And that's what we are to the world sometimes. We can be too much salt to folks and, it, and, and they want to spew you out of their mouth and everything. Problem with, oh God, I wrote this down, man. I wrote this down and boy, I had to take about a five minute break on this one. The problem with Christians nowadays, we come into the church and we salt one another. When Jesus said, I want you to be the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. We want to salt each other. Hey, throw a little on me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Let me throw a little on you. We want to salt each other. Seriously, we want to salt each other. But Jesus said, no, that ain't what I've called you to do as a disciple. You be the salt of the earth and go out there and salt them. They need it. These folks right here should already have some salt. You don't need to salt one another. And it's really the truth. We do that. We're easy to come in here and witness to our brothers that we know is pretty well saved. But how much salt have you got to go witness to a brother or sister out there that you know is lost? But they might get irritated. Okay. It's in the, the little salt gets in their wound. It'll help heal them. It'll help them. It's going to be really good for them. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, help us with this. I'll tell you what we need to do. <laughs> here's what we need to do as a church. And here's where I'm going to end it. Here's what we need to do as a church. Believers, believers, listen to me. We need to get out of the salt shaker. We're still in the salt shaker. We need to get out of the salt shaker and start getting it out into the world. That's what a true disciple is. Amen. Matthew 5, 3 says this right here. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When we got a pure heart and we care about people and we go, we go out and we're trying to be the salt of the world, we want to be a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, and we get into our community and we become genuine for the Lord, then lives will change. And here's where I'm going to end right this with this. You know the Dead Sea over there in the Middle East? Nothing lives in the Dead Sea because there's so much salt in it. Nothing can live. Fish, nothing can live in that Dead Sea. It's just salt. There's salt, salt, salt. And where they used to get their salt back then to preserve things was out of that Dead Sea. But then when the water goes down in certain places and that salt dries up on the land, it loses its savior. It loses its flavor. It's no more salty again. It, it, it kind of contaminates. The things around it die. You can't have a water around it. It'll poison you. It kind of changes a little bit when it gets out of that sea. It just dies out and everything. So I, I did a study on this. This is interesting. So even the plants around there would die. Anything that touched it outside of that, after it lost its flavor and its savior or the salt in this, it become contaminated. So what did Jesus say? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, let me find it. Just now come to me. What did Jesus say about... We are the salt of the earth. And he says the salt has lost its savior. I just read it. Where was that? Huh? 513? Of what? Matthew. Matthew 513. Yeah, thank you, because this is really going to help us right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, thank you so much. This just come to me. What they would do with that stuff that was contaminated... They didn't want it to get in their wells and their water system because it would poison you. It was bad stuff after it dried up on that land and the elements of the air and the, and the, and the, and the weather hit it and everything. You couldn't use it to, to preserve or to flavor stuff no more because, one, it had lost its flavor. Two, it had become poisonous. So they would take that stuff and put it on the roads they traveled on. And what it would do is it would pack down. It would kill any weeds from coming through it because it was so... It's better than Roundup ever was. And this is where Jesus gets this scripture right here. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and to trotten under the foot of men. They're walking on it now. Meaning this, I, I didn't ever see that until I did a study on it. That's just not on there for no reason. That's put on there to keep the weeds out and feed people walk on it now and just be trodden under men because it's lost its flavor, it's lost its pre preservedness, it's lost what it was designed originally to do. And Jesus is saying the same thing about you, that if you've lost your flavor and you've lost your, your saltiness to go out and try to witness for him, then it's no count for nothing but just men to walk on it. Now, we go back to this. Come on up here, worship team. Do you really want to be a committed disciple of Jesus Christ? That's a lot of cost right there, isn't it? To be one, you've got to worship at all costs. You've got to bear your cross daily. You've got to deny self. You've got to deny personalities. You've got to deny reputation. You've got to, you've got to love him more than you do anything, anybody, anything to bear that cross. Do you want to be a committed disciple of Jesus? You've got to work. You've got to build that tower. Continue to con be in construction of what God is doing in your life. Let him build on you. Let him grow in you. Let him, let him put that solid foundation for when the enemy comes one day, you'll be able to stand. Do you want to be a committed disciple of Jesus Christ? You've got to go to war. You've got to stand up and fight. You, this is not no easy thing. You know what? You let the enemy push over on you, and he'll overtake you. But greater is he is in you than he is in the world. Jesus is your general. He's a fighter for you. And then finally, look, folks. If you want to be a true, committed disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to witness at all costs. You've got to be the salt of the earth. You are the salt now. You are his representation on this <laughs> earth. Don't let it lose its flavor. Don't let it lose its preservedness. Don't let it lose its seasoning. Let it be out of love and concern. Amen. Because, folks, if you've lost your, 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 your effectiveness as salt, 
Jesus said, you just might as well be on that old road and just let people walk on you. You're no good for nothing. There's a cost in serving Christ. There's a cost in being a disciple. Now, how many of you want to be it? How many want to bail out right now? Folks, I'm trying to tell you this for a reason. You're going to need this when the day's ahead. You're going to need this. I'm trying to help you. I feel it in the Holy Ghost right now. You're going to need to be a true committed disciple before Christ comes back. It's going to get tough out there. And I'm not trying to be a doom and gloom. I'm trying to just give you some challenges that we've taken for granted. I say we, and I'm talking about me, that I've kind of taken lightly and tried to smooth right along and ride right along. But it's really time for us to really get up and say, and shake ourselves and say, okay, I need to do a reevaluation on my, my life with Christ. If you need Jesus today, I can't think of a better thing to surrender your life to Him and let Him put you now in the army. He'll watch over you. He'll take care of you. Maybe you're here today and you, you, you started a good work and you stopped construction. You got tired. You got weary. Maybe you're here today and the enemy is coming against you and you put your sword down. You quit fighting. Please lay off me, devil. Please. I won't bother you. Just... I won't talk about Jesus. Just don't bother me no more. Maybe that's you. Or maybe you're one that want to be a disciple, but you have quit the witnessing. You just don't share Jesus with nobody because you don't want to offend nobody. You don't want the salt to irritate them. So, so I just kind of back off, and I hope they come to find the God one day. Folks, a true disciple is one that stands firm and fights firm, witnesses firm, lives firm, all that. He's looking for some soldiers today. He's looking for some warriors. Does he have any? Is there any in this room? As we sing, let's stand. I think it'd be a good idea to dismiss like this. I'm not reading your mail. I don't know what you're, where you stand. But I know one thing. This right here has really done something to me that I was thought I was in line with and stuff, and I found out just how out of line I was. I want us to kind of just gather around right here as they sing. And let's just, let's just ask God to evaluate us. Say, Lord, I heard the word. I want to be your disciple. What areas do I need work in? And let God talk to you. We're not going to put nobody on the spot. I'm not going to come up here and say, oh, you're this and you're that. Let the Lord tell you. He knows more about it than I do. Come on out. Come on, gather around. Let's sing one song. Let's be together on this. Let's be together because I want us to be, you know, an army is better when there's more than one. You can't go into a fight by yourself. We need each other in this. Let's just pray and ask God to help us to be that committed disciple and that salt of the earth that he's calling us to be in Jesus' name. Come on.